Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the second class of this week, if you were here on Tuesday. If you are new, welcome to this class. Keep in mind, the class material is not on Brightspace, but if you go to Brightspace, you will find the link to the wiki for this class, or you can just type inside your browser, andreafedi.com, and you will find the link to this class, or you can add to andreafedi.com slash CCS325, which is a shortcut that will take you to the class website in Notion, which is public, open, doesn't require any login. It might not come up if you search it in Google, because Google doesn't really index sites such as this one, even though they're public, because they're not significant, they've not been linked by others, they don't generate significant traffic, etc. A couple of updates. As promised, I edited the video recording of the first class. I cut out the final discussion, of course. I kept the lecture about the introduction and the part about the syllabus and the class components. And you can find it both under week one. It's embedded. You can just play the video inside the page or you can go to YouTube. My channel under my name is also public. And this time, if you use the search box of YouTube and you put there CCS325, you will find the videos for this class. They will not be uh, ignored. Uh, so just to show you a little bit of the video, I don't know if the volume is coming out correctly. No. Let's see. Kind of technology. We are used to okay. in our day. So if you missed the first class and society, whatever you have same, time, technology go those for beyond this video. It's primary. And function. the video means, as you can see, user has the chapters the execution of that function. The video is divided into its main segments. So later on, let's say when you're preparing for the final exam, when a short list of topics and films for the final exam has been published, you can go back and review those segments that correspond to a topic that should be reviewed for the exam, right, etc. Uh, the other thing that I did after this presentation was already prepared was to create Google Docs files for each student in this class for the assignments. As specified in the syllabus, all of the assignments, all of the written assignments, there will be about five, plus the sum of the class activities, perhaps, and more importantly, the final project will be posted within the same file, which presents various advantages, if you come to see me to discuss the class, it's simple for either of us to open the file and talk about an assignment. But more importantly, if you have questions about an assignment, you can use the comment feature inside Google Docs where you say, Professor, can you explain? Or, Professor, am I doing this assignment correctly? Let me know before I proceed. Because that will generate, since I created those files, will generate a notification on my side, which will appear on my inbox. And as soon as I can, if I'm not in a meeting, etc., I will respond to you, okay? So if you have any questions about the Google Docs files, first of all, you should have received a notification. The files were created between 11.30 and 12.30 today. You should have received a notification with the link and once you open the file, there are already some instructions. And otherwise, let me know. Reach out to me. 
come to talk to me after this class or come to my office after the class in the fourth, on the fourth floor of the library E4340 inside the Center for Italian Studies because I'm the director of the Center for Italian Studies, but my office is easy to find once you enter or send me an email asking for instructions. Okay, there is also an announcement about the Google Docs file, so you can also consult the announcement page. Okay, this is the plan for today. I'll go back to the general introduction and I will also provide a recap for anyone who wasn't here as quickly as possible. I will try to do an activity in class, talk some more perhaps, and before the end of the class, I will show you 15 or 20 minutes from the first movie of the semester. Usually movies will be shown on two separate Thursdays. So today we will watch the start, the beginning sequences of the movie, and then Thursday we will watch some more of it. And there is a specific page where not only you can find a synopsis, a detailed synopsis with quotes that I put together, but you can also find images from the film. You can find PDFs with screenshots of the film. If you're into film studies, if you want to analyze the uh, style of the film, that's the way to go, right? I usually take films and then automatically take a screenshot every second so that all the frames are represented, all the camera angles, the editing can be studied, etc. It's, it's not a requirement, but again, routinely, there are fil film studies students in this class, and I myself uh, was in the Department of uh, Cinema and Cultural Studies before it was closed, but the courses are still there. And that'll be it for, for today. So, what were we trying to do on Tuesday? We want to talk about the technological innovations that caused a real revolution within the field of transportation and mobility within the 19th century. And we want to observe how culture reacted during that time, how those technological innovations were represented, and from that we want to extrapolate the significance that those technologies had, the place they occupied, not just in the economy or in the political arena, but in the minds of the users of these technologies or anyone who came in contact with those technologies. And the end goal is to be able to recognize how different the representation of the automobile the perception of what the automobile was about was compared to other inventions from that era, from that period. For example, we studied one of many illustrations we have of the inauguration of the first railroad in England almost 200 years ago, September 27th, 1824. And we could see in this image that the technology was presented to the public simply emphasizing the utilitarian function, the primary function of this technology. And we'll see that for modern technologies, technologies associated with what we define modern cultures, the primary function is not necessarily the most important, right? What was the primary function? of smartphones to talk and communicate with other people. Are you using your phone primarily for that? Some people do. A lot of people use the phone to isolate themselves, right? To scroll, to uh, access content 
from the internet, not necessarily to communicate. And in what other ways a modern technology in its most extreme example, such as the phone, is adding to your life, shaping who you are, and shaping how you interact with other people, right? We noticed also how this technology was not considered a powerful disruption in society, right? It generates some curiosity, but the reactions are not extreme dramatic, right? There is no fear or other emotional reactions. It is not disruptive, this technology of the train, in reference to other existing technologies, right? It integrates with the use of horses to the point where a horse is walking in front of the train to make sure that people are not crossing in front of the train, that animals are not blocking the train tracks, etc. So this is not, based on this representation, the most thrilling technology. It's not a technology that makes you dream. It's not the place for adventures. And of course, there will be, during the 19th century, novels or plays. Later on, there will be movies, right? What's the first silent movie by the Lumiere brothers about, famously? It's not, well, it's contentious whether or not it is the first, and you, you can argue that, but... The train entering station. Right? A train almost coming in the direction of the spectators, and anecdotal evidence indicates that people reacted as if there was an actual train coming their way. Okay, But in general, even today, you may find a few films that are thrillers where there are adventures based on a train, but what's the role of the train? It's not the vessel for imagination. Rather, it creates an interesting constraint, right? whereby the characters on a train cannot leave the train. They have to find a murderer. They have to find and deactivate a bomb, right? Films about the automobile are quite different, as we will see in the rest of today's presentation. And the same is true pretty much for ships. You can find adventures at sea, but those adventures are not focusing on the ship itself. The ship is just a pretext for those adventures, for the most part. We looked at the representation of a steamship, and again, even in this image, the message related to the technology is all about transportation. Braving the waves of the Atlantic Ocean, dominating the natural conditions to take people and supplies everywhere, right? Is, is not, again, a disruptive technology. The old technologies is, is, are found, uh, the old technology of the sail is found on the ship itself, and there are other uh, vessels that proceed only with sails. No big disruption. And in fact, we will talk about the evolution and the history of technologies, but when you talk about sailing, well, using the power of the wind with sails to move passengers and supplies, this will go on for almost another hundred years, right? It's not like steamships caused uh, traditional ships to be abandoned. We talked about electricity, and I showed you this uh, more recent image of a power plant at Niagara Falls because we all associate electricity with energy and we know that this energy travels through the wires to get to our homes. But what may be overlooked within a discussion of revolutions in the area of transportation is that electricity before becoming a widespread source of energy, 
was used to transport content, data. Electricity is in itself a vector, can be used as the vector for a signal. And in fact, before electricity was used for illumination and other purposes, it was applied to this miraculous invention of the telegraph, where with great speeds, messages can be moved from one area to another. And this is really the beginning of a larger revolution within the culture of the time, because this is where the concept of speed reaches, the phenomenon of speed reaches levels previously unknown to any other civilizations. And you get the idea that speed can be considered quite another dimension. And later on, from the beginning of the 20th century, you have this idea that speed is the distinctive quality of modern societies. But speed is a dimension because later on, in association with the automobile, it's something that you experience and where you exist. It's a modality, a new modality for life and you start to understand in here how the automobile becomes more than a means of transportation to move from point A to point B. It's not about covering that distance. It's about what you feel while you're traveling at speed, moving from one place to another. And then at some point, pretty soon, it's just about moving without destination, right? What you can call cruising in some cultures, but what is essentially the use of the automobile without any secondary goals, right? Not to get somewhere or not to get to an external destination. It could be an internal destination in some works of fiction or films, right? Whereby driving, let's say driving at night on a particular kind of road becomes a mystical experience that allows you to get deep into your thinking or get deep into the emotions that you are feeling. And by you, it, it can be any of you if, if you had that experience, but uh, more often is the character in a film. And I provided an example that we'll look at later. This modern monument celebrating the first automobile trip in the real world made by Bertha Benz in 1888 reflects our view or the more recent view of the automobile, which is not simply a vehicle, is not simply an extension of the rider or passenger or the driver. The automobile here becomes the in, in a, is represented in its essence, which is movement, right? In fact, the automobile in the sculpture has almost disappeared. You see the shapes of the wheels because the first vehicle used by Bertha was a tricycle, but Bertha and her two sons turn into a scene from Mary Poppins, right? They're floating, they're almost flying because the automobile is just about the experience of motion. And driving the automobile is about being in motion with it, being one with the automobile. So it is not the automobile is an extension of my body, my body moves, and with the automobile, I can extend my movements, move over longer distances at a higher speed. No, it's something different. It's something that we defined as a symbiotic connection between the driver and the vehicle. Something that you can demonstrate and reflect upon when you think about how you interact with the automobile. For example, when you're driving, you hold the steering wheel, but are you watching the automobiles? You're not, right? You're moving as one.
You're not looking at the corners of the automobile, unless you, you get to a very narrow point, let's say in my wife's village, Monte Ventolini, in Tuscany, where you kind of turn without stopping and pausing and observing, but otherwise you just move. Or think about the experience of, let's say, coming to the university while thinking about an exam, while reviewing in your mind something, right? You can do that. Your limbic, your basic system, the system of your body takes over and drives as long as there is no traffic to complicate the situation that requires your, your attention. And therefore, your basic nervous system takes over the action of driving while your mind is free to think, right? Sometimes I, I think about my classes uh, when I'm driving because, of course, I'm doing the same itinerary that I've done for the past many years. So think about those things and concepts. We talked about the impact of the ship, of steamships, of trains on the environment, and certainly the automobile has an even greater impact. But think not just about the environmental impact. Think how in the US, especially during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the construction of highways everywhere, including Long Island and the vicinity of New York City, caused the relocation of, great, of a great number of businesses and people, right? You start by building highways to connect major urban areas or commercial hubs, but then once the highways are there and they generate traffic, people move, and you can see that even in this image, people want to move next to those highways. And during that era, well into the 1970s, there were neighborhoods, even in New York City, that got depopulated because people wanted to be closer to certain thoroughfares. Okay, that's the biggest impact. And we talked about suburban areas and how houses in those areas serve the need of people moving with a car, right? The house is an extension of the driveway, and the driveway uh, leads to uh, the communication networks. And to have basic, conspicuous evidence that the automobile to this day is being presented and marketed as a different kind of technology, which is not about transportation, rather it is about the thrill of it, you have this constant obsessive emphasis on the speed. Even when speed is not accessible with a street legal car in any way, shape or form possible, or even when whoever drives these cars or whoever purchases these cars is not really able to master those speeds, even on a street. And I provided several examples. This is a recent example of an American car that has a top speed of 300. But even electrical cars were marketed the same way, right? This is an extreme example of the Remac Nevera presented by Marcus Brownlee. But Tesla did the same. From the very beginning, Tesla insisted not on the electrical car as a green car, as a car that is easier to maintain, uh, that is, is supposed to be more reliable because an electrical engine and the transmission of an electrical engine are much simpler than an internal combustion engine. No, they never, almost never used those arguments Marketing was just based on ludicrous speed, right? And this is one of the explanations we can give for the failure of the Green Revolution in transportation, right? Because if you feel obliged to have bigger cars with electricity and faster cars with electricity, 
then you need so many batteries that the car becomes twice as expensive, right? Electric cars don't have to be expensive. And we'll see alternative models, alternative examples that you can often find and see in Europe, especially in urban areas. But the, the big companies didn't want to go in that direction. And this could very much turn to be suicidal as a move and, and cause not only the failure of the green revolution in the electrification of the automobile fleets, but also the failure ultimately of those companies. One way to realize how different in terms of the connection to the mind of the users and to society the automobile is, is to consider how many museums, this is the MoMA in New York, have included in their collection automobiles as an example of art because of their design, right? And it's not something that happens with a lot of other technologies. There are always exceptions, of course, right? You can find hammers as part of installations at the MoMA. You can find a bicycle, bicycle wheel as part of, an, of a sculpture by Michel, Marcel Duchamp. But those are the exceptions, whereas a lot of museums have now <coughs> included cars as works of art. We looked at this poster from Northern Europe from the earliest years of the 1900s because it's a good metaphor of the relationship between the car and society, the car and culture, because it speaks, it represents two themes that will be uh, uh, analyzed and discussed farther in this class. One is the theme of the rupture, which is represented, if we want to analyze this, simply by the woman in this representation. The rupture means that the technology of the automobile is able to overcome the rational filter of the user and speaks directly to your guts, to your body, to your nervous system, okay? I don't know if you've seen the movie Rush about the 1976 Formula One championship and the rivalry between Formula One drivers James Hunt and Niki Lauda. The film was directed by Ron Howard. Anyone still streaming? You've, you've seen, you know about it. There is a famous scene there, and I've provided a link inside the wiki, where somebody asks Niki Lauda, who at the time of the story had already won one Formula One championship and would win two more later on. They asked Niki Lauda, how do you drive the car? And he famously answers, you drive it with your butt. Because the butt is the point of contact between you and the car and you become one with the car. That's what he wants to communicate with that punchline meaning that you feel all of the car within your body. And the other aspect emphasized by this representation is a form of symbiosis, what I said before. The idea that the car is not a mechanical extension of our body. The car, through the connection with our body, gains access to our nervous system, and we, in turn, gain access to the mechanical parts of the car. We feel the engine, we feel the body of the car around us, like an exoskeleton. As I said before, you don't look at the car when you're driving, you just feel it. Some people do, but that, that's a, a small number of people. For the most part, once you get accustomed to driving, you just feel the car around you. And in this particular representation, you can see how the car becomes humanized and the driver becomes dehumanized. We mentioned how, strangely enough, 
especially during the last 20 or 25 years, a lot of automobile museums have opened all over the world and tourism has benefited from this. There is an entire branch of tourism based on visiting museums. For example, as part of the marketing campaigns, you hear now and for the past 10 years about the Motor Valley in Italy. Do you know where the Motor Valley is and why it should be called Motor Valley? Try to guess. It's the area between Modena and Bologna where the original factories for Ferrari, Stanguellini, Ducati, Lamborghini and other small manufacturers, Pagani, could be found. And nowadays there are several museums or collections that you can visit. Please. I'm sorry? Yeah, Emilia Romagna. That would be the northern part near Bologna, about two hours south of Milan. And in fact, there are plans to have a, an automobile museum even in New York. I, I don't know if this will happen. I said strangely during the last 20 years because we'll see how clearly the technology of the automobile has plateaued or is going in the direction of a decline in terms of importance, both commercial importance, right? As you will see from my notes, in the 1960s, when you looked at commercial products, one out of five dollars was spent for automobiles. And you can think, yes, Professor, must be even worse now because automobiles have become so expensive. No. There are so many other commercial products that we spend money on that the automobile does not represent 20% of the market, okay? So things have changed and will continue to change. So the automobiles are a test, the museums are a testament to the relevance of the automobile in the past. We talked about to look at the evidence for the unique status of the automobile as a technology at the market for vintage cars. This is an example of a Ferrari sold by Sotheby's in California a few years back, I think in August of 2018, for $48 million. And that's not even the most expensive. I mentioned how this August in California, three auction houses convening for the Pebble Beach concourse around Laguna Seca, sold about $400 million of cars in just a few days, just three companies, just one event. And it was the same last year. Actually, they lamented a decline because it was 2% less than last year. I don't know how they will make do or, or continue on, but there are elements that make us think that there is a shift, right? The problem there is that there is a generational cultural change that when a big collector dies, someone who has collected unique cars, at this point, chances are the family, the descendants, will sell those cars, not keep the cars, because the next generation is not attached to them as much as the older generation. As I said before, there are a lot of films about the car and the magic of the car. And the first thing you think is, is films about racing. However, those films are not that common. There are always a few, right? Right last year there was Need for Speed, which was decent enough. If you, if you find it streaming, especially if it is free, watch that film. It is based on a real life event. So decent. This was a nice movie for the Ferrari. And from this movie, I've linked two videos that I suggest you watch. And I'll show you one of them right now. So, Matt Damon is playing the part of, a, uh, of Carol Shelby, who was the manager of a racing team, a successful racing teams, and gets approached by Ford. Ford, at that point in the 
1960s, is angry at Ferrari because Ford was about to purchase Ferrari. Ferrari had a lot of financial problems, which you can see also in the more recent film Ferrari with Adam Driver, right? So he was on the verge of bankruptcy, needed a, an influx of cash. And uh, Ford promised to buy Ferrari, the company. And Ferrari, who was very shrewd, very astute as a businessman, said, as a good faith gesture, before you buy my company, he told Ferrari, he told Ford, you should buy a building that I own in Bologna. It was a large building, as big as a block. And Ford bought that building, and then the purchase of Ferrari didn't go through because Ferrari wanted to sell the company while retaining control of all the decisions pertaining racing. <clears throat> so if you go to the Enzo Museum near Modena, you can see a big picture of the draft, the type, typed draft of the contract where Ferrari, who always used purple ink, said, no, it doesn't work, next to a paragraph that restricted his control of the Scuderia Ferrari after the purchase. So uh, one of the drivers that Shelby relies on to win the 24 hours of Le Mans on behalf of Ford, that was the revenge. Ferrari had won the, the Le Mans race, which was a very famous race. We'll talk about it later in the semester, but we'll watch a movie about it with Steve McQueen. Ferrari had, had won the uh, Le Mans race five times. And the revenge was supposed to be, let's take that from Ferrari. And Ford hired Shelby. Shelby hired Ken Miles, who was both a great driver, but also a great engineer, someone who could work on the setup of the car, right? And the video is Ken Miles talking about the perfect lap. And he's a driver, race car driver, but he's not talking about winning. He's talking about the mystique of the car, about the magic of driving at high speeds. Again, it's all about the strong symbiotic relationship between the car and the driver, right? It's not about the race or winning. Uh, Ken Miles could have won the 24 hour of Le Mans. He was cheated out of the win because the four team, the managers wanted to have all the different cars in the team get to the finish line at the same time. And I will not explain why this technically robbed him of the victory. So I was saying, when you think about films and cars, don't think about racing, because there are very few films about racing. We'll watch one that, in my opinion, is the best of them all. Le Mans, Steve McQueen, 1971. The most common film genre associated with the car is the road movie. And there are road movies in every national cinema. In every area of the world, people are making road movies even now, because it's one of the simplest films to produce and shot. The model for the genre, what can be considered the first full-fledged road movies, road movie, came in 1934 by famous Italian-American director Frank Capra. It's called It Happened One Night, and it was so well done that it won five Oscars the, the, the most important Oscars, right? Best director, best movie, best actor, best actress, um, best cinematography, etc. In terms of the attachment, the emotional attachment to the car, think of Formula One, right? Formula One is not so popular in the United States. Even the docu-series about Formula One on Netflix was successful, but moderately so However, if you take it globally, last year Formula One had 7 billion viewers altogether for their races. So you can imagine the commercial value associated with it. And, of course, 
you'll find in my introduction references to songs, especially in the past. These days you don't find that many songs, as many songs about cars. My favorite is The Passenger by Iggy Pop. Try it. You'll find it there at the link. Comic books. This is one of the most famous example. It's a French series from that went on from 50, 1959 to the early 2000 uh, with 70 volumes. They're like a graphic novels. And they're all about this family called the Bayan, uh, who is a family like uh, the families of the past uh, where every member of the family is either an engineer or a driver, etc. There are novels, and of course you know about this novel because it was made into a nice movie with the dog Enzo, The Art of Racing in the Rain, and merch, right? When you look at merchandise fashion, you always find cars represented, but how are they represented? Look at this t-shirt that I took a picture of uh, at the Roosevelt Field Mall in 2018. The journey is the destination with none other than the Volkswagen bus from the 1960s and 70s associated with the counterculture, with the hippie movement, right? Notice how the yellow of the van matches the yellow of the sun because it's all about new ages, consumption of the vehicle, being in the vehicle as a mystical journey of spiritual transformation. And... When, last year, Volkswagen brought the electric version of that minibus to electrify Espo at Nassau Colosseum, they didn't present the regular minivan, right? They presented a version with a bed, a mattress behind, with pillows with iguanas to suggest exotic adventures that could be had uh, on this Right on, on, with this electric minivan, which I believe is cost has a price tag of eighty thousand dollars. Okay, but again, you market a vehicle with the idea that it'll take you places, it will change your life, it will change your lifestyle dramatically in one way or the other. Of course, it was a cheaper message, a more trivial message in the nineteen sixties and seventies where in a commercial about cars, you would see what? Cars, men, and what was the third element in almost every commercial about cars, whether it be a commercial ad in a magazine or on TV. Cars, men. Aiden? Other men, yeah, sometimes, but more importantly. I feel like a dinosaur. Try to think like your grandparents. Not, no offense to your grandparents, but try to embrace the mindset of a different generation. You sell a car by showing the car itself, by showing man, because by that point, cars were being marketed mostly to man. It was different in the beginning. We'll talk about the pivotal, crucial role of women as pioneers and women, how they embrace the technology, a technology that reduced the gender gap, right? Because on an automobile, you don't need to be a man to have physical strength or anything else. You can be as proficient driving as a woman, as, as men are. But women were always represented in those commercials, I said cheaper and more trivial because the idea was your life will change because if you buy this car, women will look at you, women will notice you, and you will be able to attract women, take them with you on the car, establish a relationship, okay? But it's something, always something else, something other than just transportation. That's my point, right? That the car is not about transportation in modern culture. Toys, of course, the car is overrepresented in toys of different kinds to this day. And the most egregious example would be Hot Wheels. 10 million cars every week are being produced. 10 million Hot Wheels are being produced every week. And 
I had this activity. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Um, let me review the assignments first because this is important. The movie I want to do. And then we, we can go back to the activity if we have time. Okay. So the next assignment is due Friday of next week. Right? You have three readings. Just the presentations that I use to read and review. Okay? You review them online. And keep in mind that more or less you don't have to get lost in the class wiki because as you move from page to page at the bottom of the page where you have the go to section you will always find links of where you want to go. For example all the links for the first week etc. I added another reading which you can download from Google Drive. The others are publicly accessible. This, for copyright reasons, I had to put on a Google Drive, official SBU Google Drive with credentials required. Have a look. You don't need to understand, remember everything. The main point, and there are some focal points here that I listed, but the main point is in, of the article from 2016, or not 12, is the car as a technology has reached or passed its peak, okay, and the reasons why. And then, by Friday, there is the first assignment. There are two options. The first option is this reflection. It's a reflection. doesn't require research. doesn't require readings other than the class readings that would be useful. Have cars lost their magic? This is the title of the assignment. And look at how it is structured. With the help of your personal experience, experiences and observations, discuss whether or not the automobile is still a technology which is presumed to possess some unique and magical qualities by virtue of its association with literary fiction, movies, TV series and cartoons, video games, popular toys, or even personal dreams, individual or family memories, right? I have a, you can write about a personal attachment you had to the car that your family used to go on vacation or that your grandfather let you play with or the car where you learn how to drive with a friend, with a member of your family. The opposite is also true. You can very much write, as you will find in here, in the other instructions, how the car has lost its magic, right? And other things, other technologies are more important to you or you're more attached to. But this should come from your own experience, your own reflection, okay? Don't use ChatGPT or another uh, AI generating language generating bot. Because first of all, best case scenario, it'll be a lame text produced by ChatGPT. Worst case scenario, it, it, it'll put you in a difficult situation because it'll be clear that it's written by AI. Last year, I remember one of the assignments included two citations, which were not necessary, were not required. One was completely made up, did not exist. You know how uh, ChatGPT can be hallucinating. The other was strange, and I want to look for it. And it was a medical, a long medical research article. And the reason why it was picked by ChatGPT was that there were more than 100 occurrences of car, but in that context, car was CAR, a, a, a technique to test the level of platelets in the blood. And, and so, yeah. The, Artificial intelligence bot thought must be relevant for cars. Okay, so just your personal reflections are fine. Remember how these assignments are part of your participation grade. Okay, so make it simple for yourself. Just show that you have reflected on this, that you have picked relevant and interesting examples. And if you need my help, of course, let me know. If you need more time, because your first two weeks are complicated, let me know, okay? It's, it's not difficult. 
This has to be posted on your Google Docs file, which is not like a Dropbox. It doesn't close. It doesn't lock you out. This is due Friday of next week. On Saturday morning, I open the files, check if the assignments are done, usually review and grade those assignments, okay? If you need an extension, just let me know. A short extension will not be the end of the world, okay? And the alternative assignment is not a personal reflection. It's based on a film. Again, because routinely there are film study students or people who just enjoy this kind of assignment more. And I don't know if you are, if you know the series Modern Love, which you can find on Amazon, and you find the link in here. It's a beautiful, they have two or three seasons, beautiful series. Some of the made for TV movies there are very poetic. They're all based on a series of articles, with a rubric with the same title in the New York Times. In this case, the original, I provided a link, was about the attachment of an Italian-American woman to her Alfa Romeo, who belonged to her dead, deceased husband. In this case, they moved it to England or Ireland, maybe Scotland, I don't remember now. Uh, it's called On a Serpentine Road with the Top Down, with Mini Driver as the protagonist. And the, the, the female protagonist has a car which she purchased with her first husband, who was also the big love of her life, who later died. And she continues to drive that car, even though it's an old, in the film, is an old Triumph British car, unreliable, famously unreliable, keeps breaking down, but she doesn't want to sell it. Because every time she goes out, she thinks of her youth. She thinks of her husband. She talks to him. She thinks about life. So the car has this function in the stories, the mystical vessel that takes you into the recess of your mind and heart. It's a TV movie, so it's only 45 minutes long. Beautiful. If you want to work on this, you find instructions in here. So I'll skip the activity and go straight to the film and circulate the attendance in case you, you just added a few hours ago and your name is not listed here, just add your name and then sign at the end of the attendance. Thank you. So, The Love Bug, Walt Disney produced 1968 film, the first of a long series, there are at least four in the original series, there was a horrible remake with Lindsay Lohan, in the early 2000s, you can watch it, and, and it's not her fault, it's, it's how it was scripted. And it sold a ton of merchandise. Even I, as a kid, I was born in 1963, I went to see this with my parents as a kid. Even I, at the, at the time, owned a toy car, the same car that you will see in this film with the number 53. And in fact, at the end of the movie, the car breaks in two, and this car could be broken into two parts and put together. Why are we watching this kiddie movies? movie? Because it's a very strong representation of the theme of the symbiotic relationship between car and driver. The protagonist, Jim Douglas is a washed out, washed out driver who's at the end of his career. He's not winning and therefore he cannot get cars his, or, or get hired by a team. He's about to give up on his career. He lives in California, in San Francisco. Then we'll see how almost randomly he finds this little Volkswagen Beetle, the production thought a lot about which car would work in here. They decided to pick the Volkswagen Beetle, I don't know if you remember the traditional Volkswagen Beetle, because it's easy to think of it as a car having a face, right? With big eyes, with a, a front part that looks almost like a smiling mouth, etc. 
So he purchases the little car only to find out that the car is powerful. He doesn't understand that the car is alive. People around him, his friend, Tennessee, who's a mechanic, his then girlfriend will understand that Herbie's alive. He doesn't, but the core idea of the film is the car makes who you are. And there are a lot of films, we'll watch a series of them with this kind of theme. It's the theme that you find in Bumblebee from the Transformers series. The theme that you find in the horror movie Christine from the 1980s, which uh, uh, will be remade and distributed shortly, okay? So for now, we'll just watch the film and think of the relevance of the car and the connection between the transformation of the characters and the car itself. And what the car gets from the user, the driver, what the driver gets from the car, how they change each other.